quite a bit of people due to uh, the singles retreat. Uh, Lewis did a great job with that, and uh, it's pretty awesome. Got to give it up for Lewis. Uh, just for rallying all of the singles in the uh, in the area. Milwaukee is there. Detroit is there. Indiana is there. Everybody's going. So everybody's a little slim. Uh, all the services, but it's great because, you know, I like it a little better when it's just the campus and the marriage, amen? Today we're going to talk about vision in light of the singer's retreat. It was entitled, Give Me Vision. So let's talk about vision this morning. Well, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when you get married, you do become a husband to a beautiful wife. Yeah. But you know, you also become you become a photographer. Yeah. And they'll give you they'll give you the phone and say, hey, here, take this picture. And I'll tell her, I'm not good at this. And she'll say, Yeah, it's it's simple, just take the picture. And then when I take the picture, she's like, these are terrible. <laughs> well, I told you I wasn't good. <laughs> you didn't want to listen. <laughs> And then it's not just one. You got to take a picture and then another and then another and then another. And then another. Oh! And then when, you, and then when you, you take the pictures, like, this is the difference. You take the picture and you're, you're, you're scrolling and you're like this. That's all that changed is your head moves slightly. Same photo in each one. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And then they'll ask you, which one looks better? And I'm like, they both. <laughs> what do you say to that? You ever had uh, somebody, they ask uh, uh, some stranger, hey, can you take some photos? Take a bunch. It's like, man, this person needs to go somewhere. <laughs> now, one of the things that I've learned about uh, photos is that for wedding photos and for, for photographers, uh, Rebecca can, she can correct me on this. I know she, she, this is her profession here. So with, with photos, actually when it's like an overcast like this outside, this is actually the, the, the best for photos because it's consistent. So it looks terrible to you, but it looks great for the photos. Because you don't, you don't have to worry about light because it's the same everywhere. Isn't that interesting? Even though we hate it, the photo loves it. The question is, is when it's overcast like this, is it great for you? Right. Does it bring out the worst in you or the best? Help me, bro. I have a lesson. We're going to learn about uh, 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 about cameras today. The title of my lesson is Lights, Camera, Action. I have three points. The first one is zoom in. Yeah. The second is zoom out. Oh. The third is take the picture. The third is take the picture. Turn with me to John chapter four. You guys with me here? Yeah. And John four. It says here in verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his, his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Wow. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water well enough to eternal life. Mm -hmm. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I, I, so, so that I won't get thirsty and have to come uh, keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. Jesus said, I'm fed up. I'm sick. All right, all this water talk. Look, how about you go get your husband? I have no husband, she replied. He's like, exactly. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. I know you don't have a man. The fact is, you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. 
this. What you just said is quite true, ma'am. Hey! <laughs> Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> Oh my goodness! She's like, okay, you got a point there. You got me there. You got me. This is a good point here. Jesus is talking to this woman, and what he did was he zoomed into her life. There's three things that you need for a perfect picture. The first one is you need light. You need light for a perfect picture. It's the reason why you need light, you don't get the perfect picture, is because you're not shining light on the right things. Wow. Or you're not in the light at all. Wow. That's why it's hard to get the perfect picture. The camera needs light. The second thing that you need is an angle. Yeah. An angle. If you don't get the perfect picture, it's because you don't have the right angle. Wow. Yeah. You need to switch it up. You need a new approach. Right. It's also really important when you're trying to capture a moment. Because yeah. you can take a picture of it, but if you don't catch it at the right angle, you don't really capture the moment. Right. The angle matters. The last thing is focus. If you don't get the perfect picture, it's because you don't have focus. There is some type of distraction. The camera has to be focused in, or else you may actually take the right, you may have the right angle, you may have the right light, but if it's not focused, it will be blurry. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of like that with life, isn't it? You know, you can have the right light, you can have the right angle, you're doing the right things, but you're just distracted. And because you're distracted, everything, you, you're constantly in a state of confusion, not knowing how to do things or what to do, but it's simply because you don't have a focus. Jesus zoomed into this woman's life. You know, the human eye is the best camera that we have that's known to man. Yes. You know, it, it, it has the, the perfect features. It takes the best camera, I mean, the best pictures. Wow. Yeah. What photographers and uh, cinematographers, what they've, they've been doing throughout the years in developing the perfect camera, they've been trying to simply get a camera to capture what the eye sees on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They want to duplicate the eye. Yeah. I mean, if you understand what I'm saying, when you yeah. see like a beautiful sunset, yeah. and then you're like, man, that's <laughs> you take the picture, boom, and then you look at it, and you look back up, man, it did no justice. So even though you took a picture and you captured it, it's not as good as what you see. Isn't that interesting? For some things, you just got to be there to see it. The reason why they've been trying to duplicate the eye is so that when you're looking at a photo, it feels as if it's you're there, you're right in front of it. Yeah, sure. And in movies, they want to duplicate it so that when you look at the movie, it feels like a live performance, like you're there. God understands this more than anyone because he made the human eye. Yeah. This is why the Bible speaks so much about seeing or not seeing. Yeah. Let's look at a couple examples in John 7. Come on, come on, come on bro. Let's go, Mario. This is awesome. In John 7, it says here in verse 45, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the, of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, no. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. 
Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, who had one of the who was one of their own number, asked, "Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been what he has been doing?" They replied, "Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee." You know, this is interesting because we find that. This man, Nicodemus, he looks into it. Just that. He does what he says. He looks into it, and then he begins to believe in Jesus. This happened with Lee Strobel. He wrote the book, The Case for Christ, The Case for Creator. He he, he, he looked into it. He, he worked, actually, I think it was in Chicago, in Chicago Tribune. And, and he was super analytical. And he, his wife started to believe in God. He kind of waved it off as if it was nothing. It happened because his child was choking at a restaurant. Some lady comes and does the Heimlich, save his child. She starts to believe in God. And he's like, thank you. That was nice. That was very kind of you. But that doesn't mean I need to believe in God. He then begins to investigate Christ. And this is where we get the title, Case for Christ. He looks into it. And sure enough, he begins to believe. You see, that's the thing about it. If you had no belief at all, you, you decided in your heart, I, I refuse to believe Jesus at all. If you simply just look into what is there yeah. from a historical point of view, yeah. if you just look into the accounts, find out the extra biblical accounts, who wrote about him in that day, who, who, who didn't believe in Jesus at all. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence there are people actually teaching that Jesus doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. We know for a fact that he does. Right. The evidence is there. He said, go look into it. What he was telling him is, go to the man. Look at John chapter 9. In John 9 and verse 41, this is the, 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 uh, the blind man who's then healed and he was able to see. Look at what it says here in verse 40. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you see, your guilt remains. Isn't that interesting? You start saying, oh yeah, I know. Okay, well now, now you're guilty of not doing the good you ought to do. You see what I mean? Yeah. Right here you see that our eyes are connected to our spiritual health. Yeah. When people claim they can see, it then rids them of any excuses that they have. Yeah. This is why, I mean, you look into the scriptures, who is Jesus most stern, the most searing rebukes? It came to those who claimed they could see. Yeah. The people yeah. that claimed they knew. They know. Those people got the strongest rebukes because if you know that this is the religious community. Yeah. Yeah. If you know better, you should, You ever hear that term, you knew better, you do better? Yeah. You're rid, you, you rid yourself of any excuses. Yeah. But you know what's also true is sometimes we claim that we didn't know to give ourselves excuses oh. for yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, if Jesus was standing in front of you, would you still make that claim? Or would you say, you know what? Actually, I, I didn't know that it was bad. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. You guys still with me here? I'm not losing you, am I? In 2 Peter chapter 1. So it speaks about verse 5, for every reason, or for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. So it's speaking about adding to the faith, adding, adding, adding. And then it goes on and it says in verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from, be, from being ineffective and unproductive and your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. You see right here, it says that, that if a person isn't adding to their faith in an increasing measure, 
So you can't add the same amount that you added before. Right. You have to add more than you added before. Yeah. And it says it'll keep you from becoming ineffective. Have you grown ineffective? Mm -hmm. Unproductive. Have you grown unproductive? It says in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you're very aware of the Lord Jesus, then it makes you productive and effective. When we stop, when we start being unproductive and ineffective, it's because we're no longer thinking of Jesus. But what's also happening is we're forgetting that we've been cleansed from our past sins. What effect does forgiveness have if you forget that you've been forgiven? It doesn't really have much impact if you forget. This is why I'm constantly reminding myself uh, that, okay, God has washed my sins away. Yes. Amen. It helps me to understand not to live in them any longer. Yeah. I've never, you know, when I was a kid, I was a filthy, I was a filthy little kid. I used to, I used to try to run from uh, taking bath. My mom, at a certain age, was like, I can do it myself, mom. So she caught me one time. So basically, I would take my shirt off, and, and I was, you know, playing with dirt and so I, I would put my towel on. I put my towel, run the water, uh, put my towel on, take off my shirt, put my towel on, and 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 I would just throw water on on my body. And then she she come in there like, sorry, yeah, see I'm wet. So she started she started lifting my arms up, smelling under my arms. One time she was like, well, why is your back dry? I was like. Oh, that <laughs> now, when I actually did take a bath, there was all type of stuff floating on that water. Okay? Surely not. Surely not. Now, who would, in their right mind, get back in that? Right. See what I'm saying? When you see, if you've been, if you ever done a done a mud race and you take a bath and it's all floating on the side, who would in their right mind get back in it? Right. No one. So it, there's no way that we should ever see uh, our past sins as a as a means to to our future, or our present. Yeah. Right. In Revelation three eighteen, it says Jesus counsels them to buy salve for their eyes so they can see. The salve was to heal the eyes. I don't know if there's these, these eastern remedies where they would have like leaves or they'll kind of cut them up and put them on your eyes it was so that they could see. Jesus never called his disciples prideful when they were prideful. Isn't that interesting? We do this all the time. It was just being prideful. I mean, sometimes you got to say it. But he didn't do it. You know what he did when they were being prideful? He called them dull and blind. He said, you don't see what you ought to see, what you need to see, what you should be seeing. To the Pharisees in Matthew 15, 13 through 14, he called them blind guides. How can the blind lead the blind? They will surely fall into the pit. Now, uh, the blind can actually lead the blind. They're just both going to fall into a pit. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 23. Come on, bro. Let's go, Marvel. Come on, bro. Thank you, sir, bro. Come on, In bro. verse 23. All right. It's Matthew 6. Okay. Thank you. It says here in verse 22 through 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Remember, the eyes need, or cameras need light in order to capture the photo. Yeah. So if you defile your eyes with darkness, how can you see the, the picture that God's trying to paint for you? It says your eyes need to be healthy. What does Satan want? Satan wants us to, to zoom. I'm sorry. 
God wants us to zoom in. Yeah. We have to see certain things. Right. Satan wants us to stay zoomed in. Yeah. There's a difference. Satan wants us to zoom in on everything we see. It feels really good to get a closer look at things. Yeah. That was probably one of the best or worst features that phones ever made, where you can do this. <laughs> oh my goodness, you, you, can, you can just keep on zooming in. Like, who's that back there? It feels really good to take a closer look. Some of us are great at details. You're great at taking a closer look at everything. The problem is, is when you zoom in, you can't stay zoomed in if you do. You can't see the world around you. You can hear it. You can still hear what's happening. But you can't see what's happening. You stay zoomed in, I can hear everything you're saying. I'm looking at my nose. But I can't really see how you're reacting to it. I can only hear. I can't see. I can only hear. This is a problem because we become dull. You hear things on Sunday, but you don't see things on Sunday. Wow. 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 A magnified fly will look like a monster. It is just a fly. But if you ever zoom in on them, they're hairy, they have big old bug eyes. You know, they, they, they're constantly, their tongue's always out licking things. Like, flies are disgusting. What do you hear but don't see? You can hear the miracles but not see the miracles. You can hear people are changing, but you don't see that they're changing. Right. That's true. You can hear God is great, but you don't see that God is great. You can hear that God will bless you, but you don't see him doing it. You can hear that you're beautiful, but you won't see that either. You can hear that you're valued, but you won't see that you're valued. Mm -hmm. You can hear that this is the very kingdom of God, but yet you won't see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reason this is effective for Satan is because you can stay zoomed in. You will always miss the bigger picture. Yeah. And that's what he wants. He wants you to see a piece of it, but not the whole thing. Not the whole thing. Just imagine if you had, I don't know if you guys ever seen the uh, show Silo. Yeah. Yes. It's a good show. It's a good show. It's on Apple TV. Uh, basically, with Silo, they have, they're, they're in like this apocalyptic time, or at least that's what they're telling people. And basically, anything from the time before, they hide. So it's like, you know, it's like contraband. You have to retrieve it. And basically, there was this, uh, the people that find these things and they kind of preach hope and destiny and vision. And those people are known as like the kooky folks of the world. They, they like don't trust them. They're crazy. They have mental problems. There was this thing that they had that they had been passing from generation to generation. It was this little piece of paper. And uh, this guy who was uh, basically, uh, there were some people that were, they, they, uh, they were working with a, a certain department of the silo, which is basically you have uh, 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 tons and tons of people that are in the ground. And there's a silo that goes all the way in the ground. And the, the people that have a little more money are more fortunate. They're at the top of the silo and the people that are poor are down here. And they end up finding this, uh, this, this paper. And they were like, this is our most prized possession. They opened it. It was simply a picture of the ocean, of a beach. And you can see these people's face glow. They're like, from a picture of the beach. Because it gave them hope. Now, just imagine if they only had a piece of it. 
And it was just a picture of sand. It just be a bland picture. But seeing the color of it, seeing the bigger picture, it gave them hope. And that's what they were stealing from these people. Let's talk about zooming out. Satan wants to steal your hope. And for some of us, he's been fairly uh, effective. We have to know when to zoom in. And we also need to know when to zoom out. Matthew 23. Come on, bro. This is awesome, bro. In Matthew 23. In verse 23. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. You know, it's, it's important to investigate things to dig deeper, yeah. to move in, to dissect. We all need to know how to do that because some of us won't zoom in at all. This is a problem. There are, there, are, there are relationships where you may have a friendship and you never ask, how was your quiet time? Right. Yeah. So you don't even know if they're having them. Right. There are marriages like I've been in many different churches and there's always a situation where in the marriage, you don't ask about anything spiritual. You ask how their day has been. You ask, well, you know, what, what, what they're doing later on, what their schedule is, what's for dinner. But you don't ask what they've been eating spiritually. Right. We have to zoom in on spiritual matters. We have to care about these things. Because if we don't, then we'll become a social club with a religious twist. Yeah. But we won't actually be the kingdom of God. Yeah. We're, we're, we'll grow more and more unspiritual. We'll simply start to grow apart. You need to care about how you're doing spiritually. Yeah. Care to ask. Care to ask. You know, if we if we stay in a zoomed in position, though, we jeopardize the quality of life. Mm -hmm. It's great to see when things are off and wrong. But if you stay there, you'll be off and wrong. Right. This is the hitting the target and missing the mark. Right. You'll put yourself in a bad mood just because you focus on the bad things. Right. Man, I was so tempted this morning to just get in a bad mood. Just to get grumpy. You know what I'm saying? This is a series of things. Yeah. I wanted to get angry at my wife. Wanted to get angry at the sky. It's like stop raining. You know, it, it was it was fine. It was a little drizzle up until we parked, and then it's like boom, like. And then my wife is like, she just got her hair done. She's like, hey, can you? Can you uh, take out Simba and then put these bags at the bottom and then put Simba in the? And I'm like, man, you should have brought that shower cap. That <laughs> <laughs> like you were the, the bonnet looking thing. That you were on it. You brought that. Now I gotta get rain on. <laughs> I want to focus on the negative. I didn't tell her that. <laughs> It's great to disciple people. We need to disciple. Some of us aren't discipling people enough. Discipling will change people. It works. Believe it. But if you disciple people all the time and that's all you do, people will feel like a failure. People need to feel like you're a coach in their life, not a parole officer. It's great to get deep with people. But if you stay there and you're always deep, you're going to be down in the dumps. Oh, yeah. People will run from you. Because they're like, man, I'm in a good mood. I don't, want to go to, I don't want to go that deep right now. You know who's really good at this is Chris Adams. 
Yeah. 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 Man, Chris Adams is great because I mean he's just a he's just a happy dude. Yes. Yeah. He's always cracking jokes yes. all the time. Yes. Chris for sure was a hippie back in the day. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Like he, he <laughs> <laughs> Whenever it's not a church event, he has on his Jesus threes, you know? Yeah. yeah. He just toes off with the strap in the front and the strap in the back. He has a lot. He only loves them. I asked him one day, do you used to uh, play, uh, happy, what is it, nappy sack? Happy sack. Happy sack. sack. Yeah. He said, I was a beast at that game. Oh, of course he is. I can right. see that. You're one of those. Chris is funny. You're one of those. But here's the thing about Chris. <clears throat> He's a shepherd. He knows how to talk about deep, 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 deep things. Yeah. Yeah. But also, when he talks about it, he knows how to pull out yeah. and laugh yeah. and yeah. crack jokes. Yes, yeah. Most of them are funny. <laughs> Chris knows how to do that. And I love that about him. Yeah. He doesn't let issues, even though they're heavy, he doesn't let them weigh him down. Yeah. Yeah. You must learn how to zoom out. You know, the thing about zooming out, though, is you cannot stay zoomed out for too long. Because if you stay zoomed out, you'll stay checked out. You got to zoom out to see the bigger picture and then zoom in to the things you need to zoom in on. It's a constant zooming in and zooming out. This is life. You got to know how to zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in. The sermons are often that. I'm zooming in on a point, and then I pull out to show you a bigger picture. This, this is what we have to do with life. We have to do this with life. Can you help someone to have a different perspective? That's what zooming in and out is all about. It's simply perspective. Yep. How your vision works. Some people are nearsighted and others are farsighted. What are you? Is the question. Right. Yeah. What are you? You know, this is big. My third point here is take the picture. Yeah. Take the picture. Turn with me to uh to John 4. In John 4. Look at what it says here. It says in verse 34, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It is still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage <clears throat> and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Right here he says, open your eyes. The fields are ripe for harvest. I want you to understand that this city right now is ripe for harvest. Yes. We're not in the harvest season with fruit, but there still should be a harvest. Yes. It's ripe. It says that there are reapers and there are sowers. Yes. Yeah. You know, for us, uh, there was actually Pat, Pat Jr., he, he, uh, he said something once. He said there are bringers, mm -hmm. there are nurturers, and there's converters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. Yeah, we, we, have, we have sowers and we, we also have uh, people that water. And then we have people that reap. Mm -hmm. You have to understand who you are. Yeah. Now, if you're better at nurturing, then do that. I think oftentimes a lot of the younger people, they're just better at sewing. They're just better at it. That's okay. That's all right. If your job is to nurture, then do that. Yeah. Learn how to work hand in hand with the per person that's sewing. Yeah. Now, I think for the married, honestly, this is, this is a great opportunity here. Because 
oftentimes you have the campus who are always sowing. They're sowing seeds all day long. And then you have the Marys that may, may not be sowing seeds all day long. But you know what you, you can do? You, you, can, you can water the seed. Yes. You have the home. It actually looks nice in there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You go to Campus Brothers, it's something different. Oh, oh, oh. And, you know, they might not have toilet paper. They might not have paper towels. They might not. And, it, and, and guess what? They're not even going to think to to check the bathroom and see if that's in there. A married person got, oh, let me, here, let me, get, let me make sure there's some paper towels. Here, let me make sure there's some. Yeah, let me. A, a single person is like, hey, is there tissue? Yeah, it's somewhere. Look at one of those cabinets. It's a, it's a totally different experience. You see what I'm saying? Use what you have for the soul of the person. Yes. It's time for us to actually start nourishing the seeds. Right. There are many people who are studying the Bible here. Yeah. Have you had them in your home? Right. It is time. Yeah. It is time for us to nourish the seed. You guys must be here. Now, I know that a lot of us are healing, and that's okay. I love to heal, and I think it's great for us to heal. But we have to set a, a we have to set a deadline yeah. Yeah. for for our healing. It's time for you know this is what they do with doctors. Yeah. They say, hey, you know what's the healing time? Oh, the recovery time is about this long. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. They have an idea of when you will recover. Right. They know when the stitches should come out. Yeah. Do you? Mm. At, at what point will your will your wound become a scar? Mm. You got to set a deadline. You guys with me here? Yeah. I'm trying to help you out here. You're Turn with me to James chapter one. In James one, in verse twenty two. It says here, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at his face uh, at himself, goes away and immediately forgives what he looks like. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he, do, he does. So right here it says in James 1-22, through 22, it talks about somebody looking at his face in the mirror. And seeing where, where he's at. But then afterwards, forgetting. It's because they didn't prepare their hearts for action. Right. For action. When you hear this, the, the sermons on Sunday, you cannot walk away saying that was a good message and a good message alone. Right. You actually need to commit yourself yes. to doing whatever has been taught. Yeah. If not, you don't change. Yeah. Yeah. You don't change. There needs to awesome. be commitment okay. with the word or else it's going through one ear and yeah. out the yeah. other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. My mom one time was like, you need to stop letting things. I talk to you, you let it go through one ear and out the other. It's just like it needs to stop going through one ear and out the other. Do you understand? I was like, yeah. So she's like, okay, I'm going to talk to you. And I did this. So what are you doing? I don't want it to go out the other ear. <laughs> Laugh about it. We laugh about it. Let's talk about the perfect picture. <laughs> you know, the pictures that we make with our eyes, they're known as memories. There are two things with memories and long term memory. That comprises the long-term memory. On one end, it's explicit events. The other one is what they call implicit, like habits or routines. Mm -hmm. These things create long-term. That not all memories that you you experience make it to the long term, but some right. do. True. Yeah. Now the difference between the ones that make it to the long term and the ones that don't are the ones that have information. Combined with emotion. This is what creates long-term memory. You can hear a song and it can take you back decades. Yeah. It's the same with food. It's the same with seasons of the year. It's the same with smells. 
It's not just logic that creates memories. Our, strong mem our strongest memories are combined with emotion. It's because we're not just logical beings. We're biological. It means our strongest memories are created by not just learning of life, but living life. This is why the heart requires emotion. So never stop your heart from filling. You just actually need to keep a leash on it. The heart is a wild dog. If you let it off the leash, it'll run wild. I don't know if you ever see those, those people that go out to these open fields and they're like, all right, you know, let, let little Bucky off the leash. The little Bucky starts bucking. Like, come back, Bucky. Hey, come back. Bucky. Come back. All right, you're in so much trouble right now. And they're just, they're just continuing to run off. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's because the dog is too wild. Yeah. That's how our heart is. You let it off the leash, it'll run wild every time. Yeah. But it needs to feel. Action is required for experience. Mm. This is necessary. Yeah. Let's talk about the per perfect picture in, in Hebrews Chapter 12, we'll close out here. Come on, bro. In Hebrews 12. Help me, bro. Help me. This is great. This is awesome. Talk to me, bro. Talk to me, talk to me. Come on, bro. In Hebrews 12. Come on, bro. Look at what it says here. In verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, I find that those who last in the spiritual walk are those who simply keep their eyes focused on Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That is the perfect picture. There's a guy named Ben Harper. Look him up. He has a song called Picture of Jesus. It is incredible. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. A picture of Jesus. All of us need a picture of Jesus. It needs to be the biggest picture in our minds. Everybody's home, they have pictures on the walls, but there's always one spot where it's the biggest picture. It's the one that they take the most pride in. It fills up the room. All eyes can see it. That has to be Jesus. It says right here, we can run the race with perseverance. The race that's been marked out for us, we can run it. But what we need to do is fix our eyes on Jesus. Yeah. It says we can throw off everything that hinders. Yeah. We can do that. But we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Yeah. It says that we, you know what, we can also endure the cross with a joy if we Fix our eyes on Jesus. In verse 3 it says that we can also endure. We don't have to lose heart. We don't need to grow weary. But we will need to fix our eyes on Jesus. I want to challenge you guys today to start being livers of life and not learners of life. Wow. You know, the, the person that's actually living life, they get to learn the lesson on a deep level. Yeah, right. yeah. Rather than the person that just simply studies the lesson. You need to live the lesson. Live out the direction. Don't yeah. just analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. Then it can be in your long term. That's right. In your long term memory, it becomes a part of who you are. Yeah. Your long term memories, you can't shake them even if you try. Right. But that's how it is with the word of God. Yeah. 
the word is perfect, that needs to be in you in a way where even when you get weak, you can't shake it. Yeah. And Jesus, he needs to be in you. Even when you start thinking, I don't know if I can do this anymore, you can't shake him. Because it's what's in you. You know, there was a sign, there's a sign in a, a High Park. Come on, High Park. It actually says on the side of, the, uh, of this building, it says, stay true to your vision. It's a mural. Stay true to your vision. I want to challenge you guys to do just that, to stay true to your vision. Come on. But the vision I'm talking about isn't your personal dreams. Right. Stay true to Jesus. Amen. Because that's what needs to be in our vision and stay in our vision. And to God be all the glory. All the glory. <laughs>